Allison, can you hear me okay? Good morning, good morning, good morning. Now, I think I'm right in saying that everyone can now see me. Um, may I be the first person to wish you all a happy Christmas as you join me here in the People's Republic of Chorley. Um, I'm joined also by a cat, which is showing an unhealthy interest in our Christmas tree over there. So if you suddenly see me disappear out of shot, you'll know what's happened. But uh, welcome everyone. This is our final Rochdale Ambassadors event of the year. As is always the case, you get this big rush of people suddenly trying to get in from the waiting room. You can probably hear the hurly burly right now. Um, so uh, we've got a good, uh, good number of registrations for this event. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about the year that was, 2020. Uh, congratulations for getting this far, quite frankly. And then we're going to be taking a look at what we can expect in 2021. Um, we've got uh, some excellent speakers. The event is entitled Building Back Better, Looking Forward to 2021. We're going to hear from four award-winning Rochdale firms. But before all that, and I'm hoping we can hear him. We couldn't hear him last year and there were riots in Rochdale as a result. Um, Steve Rombolo, I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me, Steve? Uh, I can hear you. 
Uh, good news indeed. You can hear me. We can see you. We can see Dippy in the background as well. Um, Steve, um, we, we missed your chat last week or your last uh, last month. So if you can set the scene, just give us an assessment of 2020 from your perspective. And also um, with one eye on 2021, what we can expect. OK, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, well, welcome to the last event of, of 2020. It's the last month of the year, of course. Um, the reason that I'm speaking to Dippy is that uh, next week we'll start to uh, repackage him for dispatch. So it's probably the last time that many of you will uh, will see our, our guest for the for the year. Um, but it's probably also a bit of a year that um, we'd be glad to see the back off if we're honest, won't we? Um, it's interesting. This uh, event's called uh, Build Back Better. And to be honest, it's a phrase I don't use and I don't like. Um, its origins, I think, are in disaster recovery. It was first used by the, um, the UN, I think in the wake of the 2006 Indian Ocean tsunami, but then in the World uh, Conference on Disaster, Disaster Risk Reduction in 2015. And don't get me wrong, I, I get the concept. I get what it represents. Um, I get the importance of greater resilience, addressing the root cause of vulnerability and fundamentally making recovery, making sure recovery is done in a, in a fair way. Um, but unfortunately, it's become a bit of a, um, a slogan used by lazy script writers, lazy speech writers. Um, that's how I ended up with Boris, I think. Uh, but Biden's done it. I think Trump's done it. Obama did it before that. Um, but I think more pertinently for me, the aftermath of the pandemic won't feel better for millions of people. Here in Rochdale, we've got 5,470 more residents claiming out of work benefits than in February. So, you know, this pandemic really is having a, a big negative impact. Um, BBB, I guess it's got a ring to it, but it's too many B words, isn't it? And we've got another B word coming along that's going to be another challenge, challenges for all the businesses in this on this call, and that's Brexit. So maybe what we should do is have build back better with Brexit. Perhaps not. Um, what we have been doing is we've been trying to make sure that we're doing our best to support businesses through this really difficult time. Um, today, of course, you can all go and shop until you drop. Uh, it's a good day for that. And then you can look forward to the five days of Christmas that, uh, that the governments have given us. Um, I think that is indicative, though, of the failure of measures like test and trace that have meant that we've had to manage the pandemic through restrictions. And worse than that, it's been a sort of hokey cokey of restrictions, hasn't it? You're in, you're out, you're in that one, you're in the other one. All really difficult for the public and businesses to, to handle, particularly, of course, the hospitality sector that's really been had a tough time. So we've been working to do our best to support them. In the first um, wave, of business support grants. We got 45.5 uh, million out to 4,141 businesses uh, and 21 million of rate relief to another 920 businesses. We started the second wave uh, grants now. Um, leisure, hospitality and retail that have been forced to close. We've got 1.3 million out to them already. And those supply chains to the, into those businesses, we've got uh, over half a million pounds out, out already. So about just under two million out uh, as we speak, and we're still cracking on with issuing those. Um, it's worth, I think, mentioning just the discretionary elements of those grants. Uh, the government say there's a lot of discretion. There isn't as much discretion as there at first peer, appears. So we're not able to fill some of the gaps that national support uh, isn't filling. We can't use it for work to provide wage subsidy, subsidies or loss of income on self-employed or limited company directors. So some of those key gaps, we're not allowed to use that discretionary element to, to fill. What we are trying to do is to supplement some of the early grants to make sure that some of the businesses that the se second wave regime is a lot less generous. And so we're trying to use the discretionary grants to, to help with that. Um, we're not aware at the moment of any significant Rochdale businesses that are declaring uh, significant numbers of redundancies. But of course, the news about uh, Debenhams and, Mark and Arcadia is probably likely to mean that a number of our residents are working in those businesses uh, outside the borough, in, probably mainly in central Manchester. It's worth, I think, also mentioning our public protection team. We've been doing a lot of work 
to support businesses in terms of advice about how to operate COVID safe. And we start with that advice and information. We also have a, a, a move on to compliance checks should that should that be uh, necessary. And of course, ultimately enforcement. And it's worth mentioning this morning that along with the regulations that, that shifted the tiers uh, last night or this morning, uh, we've also got some new regulations, some new powers that enable us to close non-compliant businesses. And we will be using those powers because we've had, particularly in, in the retail sector, we've had businesses that should have been complying better and weren't making a good enough effort to comply better so we will be taking those uh, very seriously but looking forward um, in GM we're developing a, a big plan to deliver on the leveling up national agenda um, we aim to give the government uh, a, an irresistible proposition that enables them to put their investment where the narrative is um, they don't always do that of course so that's a challenge to land that but we work, we're going to be working hard to do that it's a plan built on innovation, a plan driven by public and private sector partnership in a, in a way that only GM can do it and on, the, and on good leadership, political leadership uh, supported by um, uh, managerial uh, expertise. Um, we've got our own growth plan. I think I have a couple of years to show people if you've not seen it, it's really a, a good plan. It's not very big as you can see, but it's important. Um, um, we are bringing that forward to make sure that we, going forward, we are going to get a bounce back kind of recovery. It's not the sort of thing that Rochdale usually gets. Usually we're slow off the blocks when it comes to recovery. We're slow out of recessions. We want to make sure there's much more of a bounce back feel to this. And of course, we can try and put some of the measures in place, some of the enabling measures in place. But fundamentally, that's going to be down to the guys on this call to do the heavy lifting, as always. Um, I need to say something about the spatial framework. That's part of this growth plan. It's a game changer uh, for, for Rochdale. Um, it's a big opportunity. I think you've probably heard me talk in the past about the amount of employment space in the borough, 700,000 square meters of additional space in the across the plan, but mainly in the Northern Gateway site. Um, space in that site for up to 20,000 new jobs, gross GVA uplift of 1.3 billion per annum. This is, that site will be the biggest strategic site in Greater Manchester. It, it helps us to level up the GM economy, never mind uh, UK PLC uh, economy. Um, but of course, people will have probably read that there's an issue in Stockport at the moment and there's a, a good chance that this week, tomorrow in fact, uh, the council in Stockport will reject that plan and that has implications for the whole plan uh, because it's a plan of 10, which is the right thing to do because our, our municipal uh, lines are not recognised by business, as you all know, and therefore we wanted to plan spatially across the whole of Greater Manchester, the right thing to do. But that means that all councils have got to agree to do the right thing. So if, if it does fall tomorrow, and we're hopeful that it won't, but if it does fall tomorrow night, then we're going to be, be rebooting that. And certainly this council is very clear that the Rochdale part of that plan is the right plan for Rochdale, and we will be taking it forward by hook or by crook, one way or another. Um, so we're looking at plan B's around that. I still think there's an element that there's a, a very strong drive to do this together because doing it together means that you can take into account the job numbers, for example, that are required for the whole of GM. Hence, it supports a massive strategic site in the north of GM. Without doing it in that way, we might struggle to get the job numbers that we're talking about uh, through uh, the planning inspectors. And clearly that's not something we want to do. It undermines the GM strategy, which is about uh, making sure that the economic uh, activity is spread more evenly across, across GM. So we've got lots of big plans. Looking past COVID, we can see a bounce back. I think here in Rochdale, we know what we need to do. We're getting on with it. And we've got the political leadership that know that they need to drive that too. Thanks, Chris. Steve, thanks very much, actually. Whenever I see you, um, when you log in from the, uh, you know, the backdrop of Dippy, I always think of that film, Nice at the Museum as well. Um, look, you know, I, think, I think you've done a fantastic job, actually. It's strange because we did an event, an ambassador's event there on the, third, on the 2nd of March. And it literally seems like such a long time ago. It seems like three years, let alone nine months as well. So 
And um, thanks very much for your assessment of 2020 and also your predictions of 2021. Thanks for that, Steve. I'd like to introduce our first panel. Um, I've got Paul Dixon, the chair of This Is Rochdale, who himself has spent uh, the entire year in his office in Rochdale. Uh, and also uh, Steve Marsh and Sandra, and I hope I pronounced Sandra's surname correctly, Stepniak, who's the Managing Director and Marketing and Manager of BES Limited, respectively. Um, thanks very much for joining us. So, Paul, I'll start with you, if I may. Um, how, how would you reflect on 2020 from your perspective? Can, can you hear me, Paul? I didn't hear that if you were talking. I don't know if you've got your microphone switched on, but it sounded, it looked good, even if I couldn't hear it. How do you reflect on 2020 from your perspective? <laughs> oh, I can hear you now, Paul. I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, so um, for the, uh, the, the third time of asking, Paul, um, how do you reflect on 2020? It's been that sort of year, so I might as well ask the question three times. No, I tell you what, I think we're having a few problems, Paul, with the connection. I will just check with Alison. I'll come back to you in a second, actually. Uh, I'll come to uh, BES, if I may. Um, I'll come to Steve Marsh and Sandra. Um, well, you're definitely keeping two metres apart there. Congratulations to you uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and also to Steve. I mean, BES has been in the headlines this year for, for lots of positive reasons as well. And I think one of the things that's shone through in Rochdale is that Despite the doom and gloom, there have been a lot of positive stories. Um, and here's one I need to congratulate you on, because BES, alongside um, Excitech, have been named as the winners of the Construction Computing Awards 2020 in the Innovation of the Year category. The awards showcase and reward the excellent work carried out by companies within the construction sector and the sophisticated technology they use to design, construct and modify buildings across the UK. So, Steve, first question for you. Is, is all that down to Sandra? <laughs> Even though we're two metres apart now, I've got some distance here. I think a lot of it is down to San Sandria, yeah, that's right. Certainly the fact we're getting a bit more recognition for us anyway, which is important in building the business. Yeah, what does awards, what do awards mean for a company like BES, for something like that? Well, awards generally, I think they put a smile on people's faces, so it gives a bit more of, uh, improves the kind of atmosphere and morale in the business. But I think more than that, it gets your name and your profile out and improves that kind of reputation in the marketplace and helps kind of attract new customers. And, and, and Sandra, I mean, um, what would you say as regards to winning an award like that? Because we've, we've just heard from Steve Rumbelow what a difficult year it's been. Um, and yet companies like BES have, have, have like shone a light, if you like, for Rochdale. Uh, what does it mean for you? Uh, yeah, I think it's very important to win awards, especially during difficult times like now. Uh, people at our business put a lot of effort and find so many different creative ways to continue delivering projects and improving our processes in the business. So I think that it also verifies that, that they work and that we do things right. So, yeah, I think that, uh, that it is important. It's a bit like a tennis match, actually, because the camera's going from one to the other, you know. So I'm getting... <laughs> I'm kind of busy, but I quite like it, actually. So, Steve, I'll ask you a few questions at the start. Uh, I read a story, well, just for those people who don't know, you know, because BES has been around a long time. Um, describe what BES does. We say a long time, it doesn't feel it. Yeah, we've, we've been going 18 years now, started in 2002. We work in construction, but it's a very kind of specialist part of construction, a niche market. So we design and build clean rooms and laboratories for pharmaceutical, biotech, and healthcare companies. Mm. I, I was, so, I was reading, yeah. so, sorry, Chris. No, sorry, I was reading recently, actually, um, and, and you've just been appointed to fit out the new Vaccine Manufacturing Innovation Centre in Oxfordshire. Uh, how much of your work is COVID-related? Because you create these laboratories, don't you? So laboratories in Cleveland, yeah, and we work in this life science sector that's, you know, that's associated with COVID. But, but really, there's probably two or three projects that were associated with COVID-wise. The VMIC facility in Oxford, we're currently now starting to fit that building out. Uh, the VMIC facility was conceived pre-COVID, really, to advance the development of, max, of vaccines in the UK. But it's changed now and has become... The, the focus of the project now is to be able to manufacture the vaccine for use in the UK. And that obviously needs to be built particularly quickly now. So it's an exciting project for BES. It's worth around £50 million to us. And effectively, we're fitting everything out within the shell. The walls, the floors, ceilings, 
HVAC systems, electrical services. So an important project and uh, has to be built now in kind of record time. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the thing is, it's getting a lot of attention because it's COVID related. There's a lot of companies in Rochdale yeah. who actually stepped up to the mark, you know, during the whole COVID uh, pandemic. Um, I mean, how many of your jobs would be COVID related? There's an impression that it's every job, but I don't think that's the case. No, the big one is VMIC that you mentioned. We've also completed during the first phase of lockdown a job for Cobra. Cobra were working in the consortium with uh, Oxford and Astra to develop the vaccine that we've all been reading about in the last week or two. So we built um, a clean room for, for those during lockdown that's kind of part of COVID response. And then we've been building test stations and temperature monitoring stations. It, there's been a handful, two or three projects, but the vast majority of the work is our kind of normal market. <laughs> Sandra, I'll come to you if I may. Um, BES has, has enjoyed a very good year, very successful year as well. Um, as the marketing manager, what do you put that success down to? Well, I think that there is a number of factors. I think that business um, has been built on collaborative working uh, and it's go, has been going from strength to strength for the last 18 years. And I think that uh, we can see the results of that. The company strongly um, you know, has been uh, investing in uh, software skills as well and developing our, um, you know, our, our employees. Um, I think that within the last few years, we've been taking a more strategic approach to business development as well, and uh, this supported by focused marketing. Uh, I think it helps us to build relationships with clients and promote the business and be consistent with that. And I think that people trust us. And then this combined with the investment in technology, when COVID came, we were, we, we, although it did require change, people had to start working remotely. They still found found a way to, to you know to deliver design commissions to find ways to deliver projects for our clients and at the same time we've been still engaging with clients finding new channels to to communicate and to promote our business so I think that all of that helped us to to work through this time and continue to be successful. Thanks very much, uh, Steve. Um... I mean, the reality with um, the work that you do, especially the COVID work, is that everybody wants it now, don't they? This isn't a project that you can stretch over two or three years. What's your order book looking like for 2021? Yeah, uh, 2021 and uh, incredibly for us, 2022, the order book's kind of full at the minute. So we're, we've got two years of work ahead of us, which with the kind of backdrop of all that's kind of going on is, is incredibly uh, privileged position to be in. So from our perspective, it will give us protection against any of the economic out or outcome from COVID and Brexit. So the, the business is in a really strong position. We've recruited maybe 35 new people in the last six months and are still probably actively recruiting now. So yeah, we're, we're in good shape for the next two years, Chris, to be honest. Well, if you're looking for a recruitment company, I can recommend somebody who might be on the panel. As the first time we've got smile today. Um, but uh, we'll be coming to them in a second, actually. Um, how important is Rochdale to you, Steve? Yeah, Rochdale uh, it is important. We, the business was formed in 2002. We were in Denton and soon moved to Middleton, which is part of Rochdale, of course. But, but I think maybe three years ago when we moved to Sandbrook Park, 2017, that brought us much closer to the heart of Rochdale, uh, for sure. We got support from Rochdale in terms of uh, financial support to move here which helps us to fit this building out. The office kind of reflects the business now in terms of the way it looks and uh, the kind of vibe and set. So that's allowing us to bring people in and also to retain our staff. But I think the position it is sort of central to Leeds and Manchester. We've now got a much wider kind of catchment area to bring in the resources that we need along the M62 corridor. It's very easy. Uh, I was just going to say, Steve, it's very easy. You see all the doom and gloom that's out there in terms of the negativity, but you see a really positive story, you know, in terms of what you're doing at BES. So, uh, listen, massive, massive congratulations to the two of you, to Sandra and to Steve as well. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to come to Paul Dixon. I've got my fingers crossed, Paul. I hope that we can hear you in loud technical glory. Can you just say a few words, Paul? Good morning, Chris. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Listen, that's averted riots in the streets of Rochdale. Um, so, Paul, I mean, the first question I asked you, and it sounds like a long time since I asked it three times, but I'll ask it a fourth time. Um, how do you reflect on 2020? Um, certainly an unusual year, um, a year that's generated more cliches than any other year I can remember. 
Uh, but for me, it's been the year when Rochdale rediscovered its DNA, Chris. Uh, and by that, uh, we prove that the spirit of 1844 and the original Rochdale pioneers still exist very much in this borough. Um, and we proved, I think, uh, at, at every phase of, of the, the pandemic that we've had to deal with, uh, that Rochdale truly is the birthplace of cooperation. Um, from uh, the support we had from RDA even before we went into lockdown back in March, through to into April, I think it was, when uh, the hospice uh, put out a plea for support for PPE because they couldn't get any through their supply chains and 30 odd Rochdale businesses pitched up at their door, uh, delivering everything that they needed. They, they, they were absolutely overwhelmed by that, I know. And it's continued uh, since then um, with uh, all the things that we've done to keep the businesses connected and in contact with one another. Your fantastic efforts on all these webinars that we've had throughout uh, the last uh, eight or nine months. Uh, and even now it's still going on because I know that Rochdale businesses have responded to uh, the council's charities plea for support with the Christmas toys appeal for, um, for the children across the borough. And they've had a better response than they've ever had this year. So yeah, it, it's the year we rediscovered our DNA, the spirit of 1844 and those original pioneers. And, and, and of course, Rochdale won four nil yesterday. So, you know, the good news just keeps on coming. I mean, do you put Rochdale's success, not the football club in terms of the borough, how much of that is down to the way the public and the private sector have worked together? Because there does seem to be a, a seamless link between the two. Um, that's been hugely important this year, Chris. Uh, and I've, I've said it quite a few times. Uh, RDA have been absolutely on the game throughout. Even before uh, we went into lockdown, uh, you know, February it started with daily briefing notes on what was going on. Uh, simple, single page emails coming through on the money, on the facts, just as we needed it. And that continued and that support's continued, that liaison has continued. And frankly, that's down to the RDA and all the businesses that comprise Rochdale Ambassadors uh, and beyond. And certainly all the businesses that are on this call today. That's been a major factor, that sort of communication and mutual support. And it's been important for the spirit of the businesses and the people working in them. And uh, because otherwise they could feel left on their own. I was just looking actually, we've got 90 people on the call today, which is always testimony to, to Rochdale. Um, did you think um, in terms of, if you were to look at Rochdale in terms of, I mentioned earlier, there's lots of negative stories, big national stories, big net, big, big on street retailers having to, to close, et cetera, et cetera. And yet there have been this, this, this conveyor belt of positive stories in Rochdale. No one's pretending it's easy, but there have been some really positive signs as well. Why do you think Rochdale has managed to, to buck the trend, if you like, and turn out so many positive stories? Um, I think it's down to the businesses, in particular the people, uh, the people running those businesses, the people working in those businesses, and the people around those businesses, uh, whether it be their supply chains or their customers, uh, or the support and encouragement we're getting from uh, Rochdale BC and the council. And the fact that Rochdale, um, it's small enough to still have that community spirit across the borough and everything we do and everything um, uh, we see and read uh, and in every communication we make with one another. We're not a huge metropolis where people are just, and businesses are just numbers. Everybody matters, everybody understands that. Uh, and I think that's, for me, the main reason why we've seen so many good news stories coming out of Rochdale this year. Yeah, yeah, and I, I would agree with that actually. And, uh, you know, just to, to recognize your, your two daughters both work in the NHS as well. Um, I think your wife might do as well, actually. You spent all of your time working from your office in Rochdale. I, I think your family have moved and not told you where they've moved to because you <laughs> spend all your time in your office. You speak to companies all the time. That's your bread and butter to clients as well. Um, the impression that I get is Rochdale's never stops. You know, you get the impression that some towns have stopped, you know, development has stopped. Rochdale doesn't appear to have stopped. Is that your perception, Paul? Uh, very much so. And there's been an awful lot going on this year. Um, that really has um, moved uh, many things forward in the borough and, and points to a, a very bright future. Steve gave us an overview uh, earlier on on the call on, on what the future holds. Um, uh, and I think, as, as you know, and as many know, one of the big projects that's coming forward is the uh, Advanced Machinery and uh, Productivity Institute. This uh, fantastic research and development establishment, which we're hoping to um, bring to Kingsway. Uh, there's been an awful lot done in the background on that this year. Um, uh, 
significant grant bids have gone in. One's gone in already, another's due to go in next week. Um, we've had a, a tremendous support for that across both the public and the private sector throughout the borough. Um, and we're very much hoping that we're going to have some really great good news stories coming out of that in the very near future in 2021 to really push forward the development. If and when it happens, and I really do believe it will happen, it's not if anymore, 12 months ago it was a pipe dream. Now it's become becoming a reality and we're within touching distance now. So when it does happen, it will fundamentally change uh, the economy of Rochdale for the better, the perception of Rochdale from people outside it, uh, and uh, the future prospects of everybody in, in the borough. It will lay the foundations for generations to come in a complete change to Rochdale. A final question. Um, Steve, Steve spoke very eloquently and honestly about the challenges of 2020, but also what 2021 holds as well, you know, and um, it's not going to be easy. Um, if you look into your crystal ball, Paul, what can we expect in 2021? Well, uh, uh, certainly as far as you're concerned, Chris, I, I think I think you're going to be starting a new job very soon for 2021 as a motivational coach at Rochdale AFC. <laughs> yeah. uh, one live broadcast from there and they go out and win 4-0 away from home. I know David Bottom has already got a contract ready for your signature to go on it for next year. Absolutely. And see them top Absolutely. of the league at the end of the season. I'm going to be the court jester. So basically what you're saying, you think Rochdale will win the league and probably, well, they can't win the FA Cup this year. But besides from the fact that I'm going to get a job as a court jester at Rochdale Football Club, what else can we expect? Um, I think we can expect, um, uh, it's going to be different. Businesses are coming out of uh, this 2020. Um, different. They've had to change the way they've operated. Uh, those changes in many cases will drive efficiencies, they'll drive positivity um, and things will be done differently in the future. Look at all of us here today meeting on Zoom. This was unthinkable 12 months ago, um, but we're doing it on a regular basis. New technologies have been embraced, particularly for communications, meetings, etc. Um, but I think it's going to be a positive year 2021. I think there's so much good stuff going on and, it, and we're going to build on the successes of 2020. I think 2021 is going to uh, really be the dawn of a new era for the borough. Yeah, and I just spoke about the fact that Rochdale keeps moving on. Um, and uh, it's interesting because you just mentioned about David Bottom. He just messaged me now actually to say the contract is mine. I actually put Rochdale's success down to the fact yesterday that uh, um, David had to self-isolate, you know, because there was an outbreak of COVID for two weeks. I think he's back today, but I've got a feeling no one's going to let him into the ground for the next couple of games, given the fact that uh, they won 4-0 without him. Paul, massive thanks to you as well, and uh, massive thanks to Steve and, and, and to Sandra and Steve. On to our next panel, if I may. Um, and we've got some more businesses, and, and some of the businesses that you might not necessarily have heard too much from recently. Daniel Del Sedado, who sounds like a footballer, but he's not. He's the head of communications at WCC TV. Karen and Gavin Reynolds, directors of Recruitment Solutions in Northwest. And Tom Matthew, director of Dunstan's Farm, became a father for the first time recently. And obviously, he's not allowed to turn the lights on looking at how dark your front room is, Tom. Um, I'll, start with, uh, I'll start with Daniel, if I may. Daniel, you turn your microphone on. Um, just for those people who don't know, just tell us what um, WCC TV does. Good morning, Chris. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you and I can see you, Daniel. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, uh, so while it's CCTV, the, the clue I guess is in the name, but to, to put a finer point on it, we, we supply rapidly deployable portable surveillance systems uh, to deliver live and recorded video using the 4G network. So that can be dome cameras in town and city centres, uh, it can be CCTV towers on construction sites and temporary uh, remote uh, projects, or it can be body cameras worn on the bodies of frontline workers to deliver personal safety. Everything we do is about delivering video remotely via a rapid deployment and, and redeployable surveillance system. Um, and, and just give a sense of scale, how big is WCCTV? So I, I always like to benchmark against where we were when we first moved to the Kingsway Business Park five years ago. Uh, we were 36 people turning over a, a, about six million. Uh, I sit here today, we, we are 102 people turn over somewhere in the region of 14 and a half million. Uh, and it, it's, it continues to grow. We, we, we've got 13 vacancies uh, currently available. So recruiters do, do get in touch. That would, that would be a, a wonderful bit of synergy. And it, and it continues to grow. Uh, and it's, it's, it's not slowed down in, in 2020. If you check your inbox, you've just had an email from uh, Recruitment Solutions 
Um, <laughs> couldn't even see their hands. That's what they're like. They're quick. They're quick in Rochdale. I mentioned you just mentioned earlier, actually, but you've recruited 21 people this year. You've got a strong order book for 2021. Um, what do you put your success down to? Because I know you make the body cameras and obviously a lot of supermarkets are, are, are giving frontline staff body cameras to protect them. Um, it's not just down to COVID though, is it? The success isn't just based on the pandemic. No, I mean, um, obviously I'd, I'd put a lot of the, the success down to me and my hard work. I know Sandra was uh, too modest to say so, but no, I, we, we, everything we do uh, is, is laser focused on our, our core values of, of putting the customer first uh, and at the heart of everything we do, delivering products and service innovation and, and continuing to focus on, on quality. And whether that's quality in, in the, the products that we deliver and their reliability or, or in the service delivery, we, we've set ourselves up for, for success. We also have a, a very large focus on recurring revenues. That, that gives us a kind of a strong um, start to every month, if you like, where, where we start every month with a, with a profitable uh, bottom line. But to get recurring revenues from, from anything that we do, from any of the products, we have to focus on customer service and keeping our clients in, in love with the with the products and services that we we offer and i think that's been a been a huge part of the, the success we've had and we've not stopped communicating with customers during this period we, we haven't suddenly dropped off the face of the earth because covid came along we've we've innovated in terms of exactly this keeping on zoom meetings uh we i'm actually hosting a uh, a webinar myself next Wednesday for 75 CCTV managers who work in the public sector. Normally we would we would travel down to their premises, show them our latest and greatest products, but we were very quick on the mark to, to replace the face-to-face -face with, with the technological. Well, I think that's really interesting what you say, actually. Not not the webinar for 75 people. Um, I say fascinating conversation that'll be. Um, but um, but talk about customer service. I had a situation recently where I tried to contact Admiral Insurance and I, I, I contacted them. I tried to contact them and they said because of COVID-19, a number of their staff are working from home and, uh, you know, you might get a slightly longer delay, but their safety of their staff is the most important thing. And I was on the phone for so long, I couldn't get through to anybody. It's not an excuse. COVID-19 is not an excuse for poor customer service. And I think the customers and the businesses that have done well have kept, um, have maintained a really good customer service. How did you as a company like prepare for COVID? Because you are a manufacturer. I've been to your, your business. You do make things and you do have people in reasonably close proximity as well. People like yourself can work from home, but not everybody can. So how did you prepare for COVID? Yeah, no, that's absolutely correct. I mean, nobody necessarily could have predicted how how this was going to turn out, but we did get a relatively early heads up. We we were due to attend uh, an exhibition in France in, in early February, which got cancelled due to COVID-19. And it, it was at that point that everything started feeling very close to home, very real and potentially having an impact on the way we do business. So we, we began having open conversations at that point about what, what would we do? And that led to, as you say, the, the posting in place of working from home for people like me who don't necessarily have a, a, a tie to a, a, a physical piece of this, this office, if you like. But the people who do have to be here, the people who do keep the manufacturing turning, we, we took a lot of measures. And yeah, customer service and, and keeping the business going is important. But fair play to Admiral, the, the, the safety of people has been a key priority for, for most successful businesses. And we, we took several measures to, to ensure the, the, the safety of our people, which included hiring a second premises at uh, Kingsway Business Park. We took one of the logic offices just at the at the top of Kingsway Business Park here where we could split our manufacturing processes. So the team essentially split itself in half and were able to maintain more than a two metre social distance in because of having this extra space. Our engineers uh, are another group of people who can't work from home they're they're the guys who go to sites to either refuel or maintain the equipment that we have on construction sites we we invested in renting additional vehicles so that those guys could travel separately usually they would do would go out in teams of two they they now have their own individual vehicles and we we liaised constantly with our key customers to say look if if our engineers are turning up to the site they, they don't want to be sitting in a poster cabin huddled together getting a health and safety briefing we'd like to move those briefings to, to online we, we don't want to be signing in and out with the same pen that 
you know, 100 people have used in, in the same day. It was going into those really sort of minute details that kept our people safe meant that they were confident to still keep going out and doing the job or keep coming to work and, and doing the job. And, and yeah, I, I think we've been really successful in doing that. But that's, that's, you know, that breeds loyalty and it breeds confidence among your workforce as well, actually. A um, couple of things, you just mentioned logic. Logic's full. Um, in fact, there's a story last week about the fact that all the industrial units in Rochdale are full and there's a pipeline of £20 million worth of new um, you know, industrial units. You know, and that's another success story, another positive feel-good factor in Rochdale as well. Um, just before I do um, finish with your good self, if I may, Daniel, I want to mention one thing is that, um, and, and Paul mentioned it, went to Rochdale Football Club last week, did a really, really enjoyable event, actually, where we, the Rochdale Football Club is trying to get involved in the community. And I know David's watching the call um, because he, uh, because such is David's, uh, you know, such is David's determination and commitment to Rochdale. Um, and there's a big invite from any businesses or anybody who wants to involve Rochdale in what they do. You know, it could be community work, which they can do socially distance as well. If you want David to sing um, a Christmas song, he will do it. He'll ruin Christmas by singing that song as well. And they've also done a deal with Zen Internet, which is great. A local company supporting Rochdale Football Club. But the deal is predicated on, you know, the more people who switch over to Zen, the you know, the better it is for Rochdale Football Club as well. So we've got 90 old businesses watching. It'd be great to see a few people, uh, you know, you know, show their support for Zen Internet and Rochdale Football Club. Um, you recently opened a site in Scotland as well. And, and um, you know, Paul Dixon spoke about the fact that Rochdale's not stopped in 2020. Um, what's your growth ambitions for 2021? Because I know they're sizable. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, opening uh, a, a brand new office right in the middle of the, the pandemic in, I think it was May, shows the, <laughs> well, it shows we're, we're mad, but it also shows a, a commitment to growth and, and continuing to get things done. We, we do have a an existing client base up in Scotland, but we were continually sending engineers from, from our Rochdale office to, to support clients up in, in Scotland. That was becoming unsustainable. So we we plumped and, and opened an office there. We, we've recruited in Scotland. We do have a commitment to uh, growing the opportunities that we have there, but it's not just there. I mean, we, we, we have huge growth ambitions. It's, it's been in our DNA ever since I, I joined the company seven years ago. Mm. In, in that time, we, we've opened four new offices. We, we we have launched a US um, equivalent of, of, of what we're doing over in the UK. The plans to, to develop that element of the business for the next five years uh, I mean the, to call them ambitious would be would be a huge understatement our, our directors are a visionary and, the, and they've been proven right uh, every single time they've they've either launched a new product innovated a new service or decided to, to go ahead and, and open a, an office in a, in a new territory and from a, a personal perspective and going back to the loyalty I mean it's it's so exciting it, the amount of career opportunities it brings for for people like myself, who are from the Rochdale area, who are educated in Rochdale, who have joined a Rochdale company, to, to have developed in, in, in the way I have and, and to have had the experiences I've had, it's, it's all down to that, to that sort of commitment to growth and, and continuing ambition and, and not just sitting on our hands. So it's, it's, it's definitely exciting and, and it, it continues to be exciting. Absolutely. And I, I think I'm going to come to Recruitment Solutions Northwest now, if you can switch your microphone on. But I think you became a dad this year as well, Daniel. So, you know, uh, Rochdale hasn't stopped. You know, it's got bigger and better, um, which brings me neatly on to, uh, you know, Recruitment Solutions as well. To, Cameron, uh, to uh, Karen and Gavin Reynolds, Directors of Recruitment Solutions Northwest. Um, you won't mind me saying this, I'm absolutely sure, Gavin, but it doesn't matter what happens, the hair never moves. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you, that's, that's what you get for living with a hairdresser. Absolutely, absolutely. If my hair is an absolute mess. I'd love to have hair that didn't move like yours as well. Um, so you're in the recruitment sector, so you know better than most the impact of COVID-19. Um, I'll ask both of you, uh, and I'll ask Karen first, if I may. Um, how has 2020 been for you? Um, simply a year of two halves, uh, January and February. Things were going well. We had we got recruitment together every day. We were well on target, over target, and then March just hit... Um, and, and it was a bump. Um, the board turned red, the deal all had to be turned back and, and, and we literally left the office. So that was that was very difficult. Um, and we didn't particularly get warning signs as such. Um, it came as a bit of a shock. So we regrouped, we went home as a business, and it gave us time, Gavin and I and our senior managers to think about what 
can. Can I just ask? It's uh, I could hear uh, I, I I could hear Gavin fine, but you're just a little bit tinny. Um, now that might mean getting a bit closer to Gavin. But no, it's not what we want. Uh, I just um, but but yeah, just sorry. You just, no, don't, that, that's 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 how you a lot. Better. Thank you very much for that. The that that's the thing about technology and Zoom calls as well. You know, you're never going to be perfect, so you just have to uh, adapt and move with the punches. I mean, Gavin, what would you say about 2020 for you? Yeah, um, so obviously, you know, like everyone else, the sector that we recruit in, um, which is accountancy, finance and office support, and it was obviously a bit of a bombshell um, in March. So we, we effectively found ourselves in April and May in a, a non-revenue generating business. Um, so so um, we, we kind of had to work through that, work with our staff, we had to use the I tell you what I'm going to do. I tell you what I'm going to do, Gavin. I tell you what I'm going to do. Don't worry, I will come back to you. But it, I thought it was Karen, but it's not. If you log in and out again, I'll come to um, I'll come to Tom and I'll come back to you. We had the same problem with Paul Dixon. He came back in glorious technical as well. So if you log Perfect. in and out, you'll be right now. Cheers. Tom, no Tom, Tom, I'll, Tom, I'll come back to you actually. So um, and I must remember, Paul Dixon. I need to come to you at the very end to mention the ambassadors event, uh, the ambassadors. Uh, survey and questionnaire that you're involved in. Um, Tom, um, you've experienced an eventful year in 2020 uh, at Dunster's Farm. Just tell us what Dunster's Farm does. We're a third generation family business, um, have evolved over the generation since 1963 to, to become a, a food service. We started off as probably really much a milk round. Um, now we're a food service, so we supply anywhere with a kitchen. Um, and we're education specialists, so 70% of our business is, is in the education sector. Um, we employ 50 people and we're based down on, on Waterford Park, which is often confused as, as part of Bury, but is on the right side of the river to be in Rochdale. Absolutely. Seeing is you've just lost the entire room there by mentioning the Bury word, um, but <laughs> we'll let you off. Uh, also a new dad, I think about uh, eight weeks old, I think you're, you're, you're first born. Um, you're a third generation food wholesaler. You mentioned earlier that you supply a lot of the schools and colleges, so you'd have been hit really hard by COVID, weren't you? They must have been dark days at the start. Yeah, it was, it's been um, a double whammy, really, because the rest of our business is in the leisure and hospitality sector, which is, you know, well publicised how, how hard that's been hit. So, um, yeah, the first lockdown, we lost 95% of our customers overnight. Um, we were sat on several hundred thousand pounds of stock, um, which we had no place for. Um, and from March to September, we were at less than 20% of our, our, our normal volumes. Um, so we lost we lost 100,000 pounds in April alone. Um, and then we've lost, you know, up till September, we lost money continually. Um, the stock loss was, you know, was several hundred thousand pounds as well. So it's been a traumatic time. Um, mm. The industry is 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 high volume. You need the volumes to cover the high fixed costs that we have of our distribution, refrigeration, transport, um, and the industry margins are quite low. But you did something absolutely amazing because you're not an online business, or at least you weren't. And then obviously 95% of your customers went, you know, because of the, uh, the lockdown as well. So you pivoted in the space of about three days. I think you had a, an online offer. Um, you weren't making the same money that you were before, but what it did mean is you were able to get stock out the door, weren't you? Just tell us what you did. Yeah, I mean, our online offer um, that existed previous was, was very B2C. It was a login with an account. And you could see your invoices, you could place your orders, but it wasn't B2, uh, it was B2B, sorry. It wasn't B2C friendly in, in any way. It, you couldn't pay, you couldn't check out. It was all, you know, dealt with for trade customers. Um, so we took the quick snap decision to um, build another website in, in a couple of weeks and, and get B2C fully operational um, as, as, the, as the first lockdown hit. And then people were kind of stockpiling, people were struggling to get the food from the supermarkets that they needed. Um, in terms of the business today, I mean, are you back to somewhere near what you would be normally? Um, yeah, well, after that 20% for six months, we then, um, with the return of the schools, obviously brought a lot of the customers back. Although, you know, admittedly, they aren't trading in the same way. Anyone with, with kids in school, no, it's, it's not the same catering operation as it was before COVID. Um, we had really ambitious growth plans and uh, a lot of new business starting in September. So we were forecast to be 30% up and we're coming in at about 90%. So we're sound of 60 60 percent where we would have been um but we're kind of 90 percent on last year if that makes sense so we've managed to keep everyone in a job so we're still employing the same number of people so um it's not you know it's not all roses but it's, it's certainly okay for now did you ever fear for your future at any point 
Um, I think we sat down straight away. We, we saw it potentially coming and, and we did the, the necessary sort of cash flow forecasting and we planned till September um, to sort of, we could get through and, and that would be fine. And we had a sort of target amount of money, several hundred thousand that we thought, well, if we keep the losses within that, we'll be fine. Um, fortunately, we've been, you know, it's very conservatively ran family business. So we didn't have high amounts of debt, if any debt at all. Um, so we could, we, we, we were in a well place to survive. But I mean, I, I really feel for some of our industry competitors who, you know, who have a lot of leases and a lot of obligations um, that, that they have to fork out for, um, regardless of the, the business situation out there. So we, we were fortunate in that sense, but we, we did plan at the outset till September. You switch from a B to B model to a B to C. You know, it's, it's not one or the other. Effectively, you've just offered B to C as a new as a new option as well. That's a deliberate decision by you, and has that paid dividends? Um, yeah, it was something that we'd always considered and wanted to do. But when your core business is growing, it's um, it's often not your priority to diversify into something completely different. So it was a, a deliberate decision, and it's kind of getting back to our roots in many ways. That's what our granddad used to do, delivering food to to, to local households. Um, so it's nice in that sense. And we've always wanted to work with more local um, artisan type producers. Um, but when you're doing sort of high volume mass catering, that can be difficult. So the B2C um, move has, has been really good in the sense that we've been able to forge relationships with lots of local companies and local producers and manufacturers to offer stuff to, um, that, you know, that people want with real provenance. Is your sister Hannah watching the call? Do you know, I can't see a list of all the people who are watching. Is Hannah watching? I'd, I'd hope so. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we haven't words if not. <laughs> yeah, I know you're very close to your sister, but between you and Hannah, who do you think is the most important to the business success? <laughs> I think at the moment I've got to say Hannah because uh, we've got the marketing. So she's got the marketing background, as you know. My my background's in in actual in in law, so I'm more on the on the commercial side and the contracts and things. But um, yeah, marketing's where it's at at the moment, especially with our yeah. new involvement, our new involvement with the public. That brings a whole whole new uh, world of challenges. See, I only asked that as a jokey question. I didn't expect you to give such a nice answer. What a nice brother you are. Um, just, uh, uh, you know, Hannah's, Hannah's probably feeling about 10 foot tall right now. Um, what does 2021 hold for you? I mean, we work in food. So, you know, I think um, Steve alluded to the challenges ahead in his, in his opening speech. Um, and Brexit is obviously a big, big challenge for, for the food industry. Um, so we've got challenges ahead. Um, and... Um, but on the whole, we're, we are optimistic about the way we're placed and the way we're footed. Um, but obviously, that is that is a huge challenge coming. OK, thanks very much. I'm going to come back to, uh, I want to say Gavin and Stacey, um, and I feel sure I will say that at some point. So I apologise for that. But I'm going to come back to Gavin and Karen. Yeah, Gavin, I'll start with you, if I may. But Can you, can you hear us now, first of all? Is that better? I think I can hear you. I think I can hear you. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, so in terms of, are you back to where you would want to be now in terms of where are you now as a business and, and also the people that you're working with? Yeah, um, I'd be a bit reluctant to say we're back to where we want to be because I think this, this most recent lockdown has been a bit of a, a secondary bump in the road, but hopefully that's all it is. I think what we were finding before the, the most recent lockdown is that a cautious optimism has definitely returned. Um, September and October would were somewhere near what we would call normal months in terms of recruitment. So people were recruiting and people were positive again and people were prepared to commit to the future whereas they hadn't been previously in terms of recruitment. So yeah, the optimism has returned. So yeah, in terms of thoughts, um, we're obviously in December now, which is traditionally a quieter term month for recruitment anyway. But we're certainly starting you know, 2021 with, with a lot of optimism, hoping that we can have a continuation of that, that mini recovery that we saw. Um, Karen, I'm going to ask you a question, and it's one that I've just, just literally just thought of as well. I mean, there's a lot of stuff at the moment about tier two, tier three, lockdown two, lockdown three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, um, from a business, and not just from your own business perspective, because the companies you deal with, you're like a barometer for all those businesses. You know, in terms of what you want, moving forward you know you know obviously we want a vaccine and we want to return to something like normal but just from a practical point of view as a business you know what do you want does a does another lockdown really affect the business does tier two make a big difference to tier three just from a practical level no in, in, in recruitment terms truthfully no no it doesn't um it, it does make a big difference to uh, 
uh, those people working from home uh, and home working, I think, is going to be a very, very big issue in 2021. Um, and one of the things that we're seeing is the very, very poor morale levels of people that are at home. I think it started off as this great big in the summer, it's quite exciting. Um, but the truth of the matter is, you know, there are some people that it suits very well working from home. You know, you've got different rooms to go into to afford to keep heating on all day, etc. Blah, blah blah. But when the ironing board has been your desk for six months and you've had very little interaction, then in recruitment terms, that is a, a, a big um, curve that is on the horizon that I think people do need to think about. Um, and the tears obviously do affect um, as people and um, to get back in the office. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really interesting. If you come a little bit closer to the to, to the microphone, I mean, um, I think that's really interesting actually because when the first lockdown happened, we had that eight weeks of glorious sunshine. Didn't get much more after that in Chorley, I can tell you. But but those first eight weeks were fantastic. Whereas now we've started this, you know, webinar off at eight o'clock today, and I've got a spotlight on because it's dark outside, and it'll be dark at three thirty today. And that does have an effect on, on your mood as well. Um, one thing I want to ask you, Karen, if I may, is that you know a lot of a lot of temporary jobs are, are, are popping up. A lot of people are saying to me that they can get temporary work, they just can't get full-time work. Is that your experience? The, 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 there is definitely a shift to temporary recruitment and, and for obvious reasons, you know, cash flow, headcount, so on and so forth, and uncertainty. Um, so we do, we have seen a significant increase in, in temporary requests and we know that that's going to carry on very definitely in Q1 of next year. The issue on the other side of the coin is that people are reluctant to temp because they're wanting to get back into permanent recruitment quite quickly. And there are still a number of people on furlough using the furlough scheme. So actually the pressures on temporary recruitment are really, really high at the moment. The candidate pool um, is quite thin and there is a reluctance for people. And equally, they don't want to go into a temporary job if they then have to go straight from getting the job to going back to, work, you know, to working from home. There's a, there's a a bit of a disconnect in terms of business expectation and what the candidates um, are actually looking for or, or feel comfortable with. Uh, I mean, Gavin, I mean, what's interesting with recruitment is that we've mentioned hospitality and tourism and things like that. And my heart goes out to anyone in those businesses because you just can't wave a magic wand. Other sectors like online retail, um, you know, uh, manufacturing, they, they seem to be they, they seem to be much more resilient. You know, it's a different different ballpark. I mean, in your experience, Gavin, what's hot and what's not at the moment in terms of what sectors? I mean, without stating the obvious, obviously the sectors that you mentioned, retail, construction, manufacturing, etc., have done really well. I think um, the thing to point out is that the leaders within those businesses have had to be extremely astute to make sure that they can deliver on demand. And um, then obviously we've seen the other side of the coin, a couple of major um, client, clients in the travel sector who just had the rug pulled from under it. But I think the area that I wanted to focus on here is um, the area locally. Um, we are doing more business now in 2020 20, 20 than locally than we've ever done in 15 years. So for me, that's kind of Rochdale supporting Rochdale. And, and that's... Um, a really, a really good thing that's been warming. You know, just a couple of quick examples off the top of my head. I, I'm walking through Rochdale Town Centre and seeing Bells, who are a fantastic local firm, doing projects for Rochdale Council. Um, I'm seeing Zen Internet, who are a major employer in the area, supporting Rochdale AFC at a major time of need for them. Um, so, you know, what we're seeing is a lot of Rochdale helping Rochdale. And I think that's, that's been the one thing to take. That's what's hot for me. Well, it's funny you say that because, um, you know, during the whole pandemic and the lockdown, um, you know, Paul Dixon, who I'm going to come back to in a second, you know, his daughter needed a car to get over to the hospital to, to work in the NHS. And he went to Rentrack and got a 50% discount as well. And uh, my wife is, works for the NHS as well. And, and I needed a higher car and I ended up using them uh, for about 15 or 16 weeks, you know, and, and you're exactly right. You know, Rochdale supporting Rochdale. Um, what can we expect in 2021? And, and I'll ask that of both of you. Uh, Karen, I'll come to you first and then Gavin. I mean, you know, how far ahead can you look in terms of a business plan? Because obviously, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty still. We've mentioned the B word, the Brexit word. Um, what can we expect in 2021 in your respectful opinion? Truthfully, I think, it, I think it will recover quite well. There was a recent survey by the CIS to say that over 55% of businesses that were interviewed have expectations to recruit 
in 2021. And that's for two reasons. One, because they need to create vacancies because there are sectors that are thriving at the moment, you know, in logistics, transport, supply chain, et cetera. And then there are those businesses that made decisions quite early on to, to let staff go. And frankly, no, they're on, they're on the, to the bone and they're exhausted. So we expect a shaky done February. And um, that's very much going to be based on you know, lockdown and, and clearly with the vaccine uh, announcement this morning, you know, things may move forward a little bit quickly. But there is, there is a very general, when we talk to our customers and when we talk to our clients and, and candidates, the general feeling is, is, is it will be okay in 2021. There is, there is expectation. Yeah, I mean, just final word to you, Gavin. I mean, we're going to say goodbye to Dippy fairly soon, but we're much more, <laughs> but we're much more optimistic, aren't we? Yeah, of yeah. course. I mean, you know, I, I think particularly focused in Rochdale, but also the, the wider UK, I think we're a resilient bunch of people. Um, and I don't think we want to be defeated easily. So I think the momentum that existed pre-COVID, people are really keen to, to, to ensure it isn't derailed completely and, and is regathered. And I think that's basically our attitude. It's an attitude. Yeah, what's with you? You're both on the uh, the WhatsApp group that we have, the uh, Rochdale uh, WhatsApp group. If you are a Rochdale business and you want to be on the WhatsApp group, just contact me. I'm, you know, contactable through most channels as well. And uh, when we put a message out a couple of weeks ago, a number of people on the group had, had said that they'd had COVID as well and had not had great experiences. Stuart Collinson from from uh, from Premier is is probably watching the call now. Stuart, I hope you're well because I know he had a particularly bad reaction to it as well. And and everybody came out and wished Stuart well. So Stuart, I hope you're getting better. Thanks very much to. Uh, Karen, uh, to um, Karen and Gavin. I'm going to just come to Paul finally, Paul. Um, I'm going to finish in two and a half minutes, but um, you're involved in the uh, questionnaire, the ambassador's questionnaire, which is really, really important. Just tell us about that. Yeah, the, the ambassador's in its current form has been going for about three years now. Um, so there's an evaluation um, study that's been uh, requisitioned by Rochdale Development Agency. Uh, and as, as part of that process uh, to, to review uh, where Rochdale Ambassadors is at and uh, perhaps what the future holds and what we can do better and stuff. Uh, there's a questionnaire being sent out to all the businesses that are uh, beyond the call today and all the other ambassador businesses that can make it today. I just ask everybody to take a few minutes to complete the questionnaire and return it when once they've received it um, and that will help the, the evaluation and the, uh, the planning for the future. Um, thanks very much to you Paul. Um, thanks very much to uh, Steve Rumbelow. Um, and uh, you know, to give us an insight into Dippy, it's amazing actually when you think you know how many people watched and came to see Dippy at the start. But but Dippy's Dippy's lived through Rochdale this year as well. You know, um, I, I think it's great to hear so many positive businesses um, stories, but also honest business stories as well. It's not been easy. Um, I think the fact we've got through to this point in time is testimony to uh, what's going on in Rochdale. Um, so it just remains for me to wish you a happy Christmas. Um, stay well, stay safe. We've still got three weeks left. Um, before we can call time on uh, on 2020 uh, and then look forward to 2021. A massive thanks to the people who make events like this happen as well, to uh, Alison Salas behind the scenes. You never see her face. We don't know what she looks like. She just uh, is in the background round, pulling all the strings as well. And uh, and to Carol Hopkins as well. Um, stay safe. And, uh, and, and Tom, just expect a text message off Hannah anytime soon. And uh, I'll speak to you soon. Take care.